And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of Amboria, role-playing in the world under Starlight, which managed to get managed to get funded in six hours and is currently at 28.4k of a 14k goal, with, uh, with a couple dozen days to go at the time of this recording. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. The one, the one and only Richard Rowland. How you doing today, man? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for com thank you for coming on and in and indulging in the glorious insanity that happens every day at this temple. Yeah, I, I love what you've done with the place. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody always seems to love what I do with the place. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe they're just shocked that that um that monks can drink. <laughs> yeah. Well, not me. I'm uh, uh I've been friends with a good number of monks throughout my life. And they've they've all been fun people. So. Yeah. But I suppose I'll start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Yes. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Uh, so this is a funny kind of a thing. Um, uh, I grew up in uh, actually the the house that I grew up in. There wasn't really like an awareness not even not of role playing games, but but not even of like board games in general. Like we had Monopoly and Risk, and that was about it, right? Um, but being the kind of person that I was, I was always trying to kind of come up with new games. And so actually, when I was pretty young. I, you know, developed, you know, what, what I realized in retrospect were, like, early role-playing games. I was really into Star Trek. So I just came up with, like, a way to play that with my friends. And we had rules, and there were dice, and all this stuff, you know. And it was just, it was very rudimentary, obviously. But um, uh, but I look I look back on that game, and I, I basically I played it with a, a, another kid who lived two doors down when we were about eight or nine years old. I actually look back on that as, like, that was really my first role-playing experience. Um, later on, of course, I discovered role-playing games and uh, uh, played a lot of... Um, uh, from the time I was nine on, I played a lot of multi-user dungeons, MUDs. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't know, it's like a text-based MMO. Oh, yeah. Um, like, without the... You know, for the young people in the audience. Um, and it's is, a game with... Little, and is based on a hacked version of Zork. Yeah, ha based on hacked version of Zork and AD and D one E rules, uh, but basically just like uh, so. There was a great Tolkien based one. I'm a I'm a, I'm a Tolkien guy, hmm. I guess you could say. And uh, anyway, there was a great Tolkien based mud called the Two Towers mud, uh, which I think is still going. And um, and uh, so I played that, and that is kind of what got me into uh, you know exposed me to like the wider world of what eventually would become my tabletop gaming obsession. Um, and uh, this really peaked when, you know, again, a lot of times when I make things, it's because I'm frustrated at other things, you know, it's like, well, uh, what if I just tried this, you know? And so when I was 16, I put together a, um, a very rudimentary, again, a very rudimentary in the beginning, but a D6-based supers system and game and started playing with some friends. And we played that game for 16 years. Um, over 800 player characters, 24 players, 16 years. Still, you know, one of the most insane things that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really like, you know, that was the game. That was the big game. Uh, and then, of course, along the way, you know, my first introduction to D20 uh, came a couple of years after that with the uh, the, the old Pathfinder beginner box. Um, and then, you know, just from there, I, I really fell in love with role-playing um, and also with game design. You know, I'm I, I've always loved designing and tinkering, as I think most of us do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that yeah, that's kind of kind of how I got to here. Long story short, it is funny that you started out with the game that starts fights and the game that never ends. Uh, the game that uh, are you talking about, Pathfinder? No, I'm t I'm talking about Monopoly and Risk. Oh oh oh, sorry. Yes. Um, 
You know, it's funny because uh, I actually learned to play Risk from my cousin, who's uh, significantly older than me. Um, but he was, uh, he was, uh, I think at the time he was a captain in the Air Force. Um, but he, he, he had just gone to like war college or, or whatever. And so he was teaching me to play risk and he's like, this is how you strategize. And, you know, this, this idea that, you know, it's sometimes good to sacrifice something that's not part of your overall objective because, you know, it'll get, get you to where you need to go. Um, and, and, uh, so, I mean, he's really the person that taught me strategy. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always loved st strategic games. Um, I've actually kind of recently, uh, rekindled a love for, uh, miniature wargaming through playing a lot of, like, 28mm Ancient World skirmish games, uh, and things like that, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could, it could have been worse. You could have started out with Jenga, the board, the, um, board game equivalent of torture. <laughs> yes. Well, I was never, I've never been one for party games. I I just like games period, but I, but I know some games can be a bit more volatile than others. And yeah, yeah. anytime somebody complains about games nowadays being too or e or even RPGs being too complicated, I have the urge to show them the campaign for North Africa. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, that I remember. There was another kind of a similar game. Um, that, that one of my cousins gave me that was, uh, it was the one like the Battle of the Suez you know, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, like all the little tiny cardboard shits and giant hex maps and stuff like that love that stuff, honestly actually still love that stuff yeah. you know, there's, there's nobody to do it with uh, but but it's to me it's still very cool it's like, I think it's cool because it's so unapproachable you know I'd like to, I'd like to say Campaign for North Africa is unapproachable but I can't, but um I've had I've had stories relayed to me of of army guys who bro who broke it out at the barracks and after a, after a while the fight broke out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, diplomacy's that way too. I, I you know like I would never play diplomacy with a group of friends unless I was like all right I'm ready for this friendship to end. Yeah, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like how there's the gag about how Mario Kart ends friendships. Yes. Yes. Um, and in all fa in all fairness, with my fr with my friend group, it was a it was a case of who, with friends like us, who needs enemies, right? Especially since there were these unwritten rules that we all had, where um, certain options you're if you take them, then everyone everyone is allowed to hit you below the belt. Yes, 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 Which, yes. That, if that yeah. seems excessive, that was the whole point to make to make a punishment worse so bad so bad that nobody would try it. Um, oh, you gonna play this character? All right then. I if you're gonna, um, like in the days of Goldeneye, the rule was if you played Odd Job after the round, ev after the round, you had to stand in this one spot, and everybody, pu everybody, um, punched you below the belt. Oh, jeez. Oh, like actually punched you below the belt. Yeah, because I fit because because that's and if you if you played Goldeneye back on the N64, you know exactly why I would do something that harsh. Yeah. I, I did play Goldeneye in the N64. I played that and Ocarina of Time mm -hmm. and Street Fighter. Those yeah. were my games. But it w and um in in yeah in, in something like Tekken three, there was a rule of nobody picks Eddie for the for the same reason, you know. Mm -hmm. And even to this even to this day, I have the um paint. I have the pain glass whenever somebody does something really stupid or gets caught cheating. Oh, it is. Painful. Yeah, it is a shot glass full of water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, Tabasco sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, sriracha, and um, tig and tiger sauce. Holy crap, dude! You guys take no prisoners. Well, if I'm gonna call it the pain glass, I have to deliver. You. Yeah, I guess so. There is option B, which is drink a bottle of bacon soda. Oh. It also sounds terrible. Well, it's a, it's a punishment. It's supposed to be terrible. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but now, with that with that in mind, um, Amboria is ver if you were to if you were to put in kind of a appendix N for 
the type yeah. of media that inspired Amboria, what would be in that list? And the, I'm not picky about what, about what the source. It could it could be television. It could be film. It could be books. Sure. It could be it could be plays. It could be video games. Um, give me some names. Yeah. So when I first started working on the world under Starlight, it was actually long before I ever planned to turn it into a tabletop game. So it was just like my own private world that I worked on, and I sometimes shared it with friends. But um, so I was really inspired, especially you know in the early days by the uh, the myths and specifically like the narrative and mythic, mythic poetry of uh, Northern Europe and specifically uh, things like Beowulf and the Kalevala. Uh, for people to know the Kalevala is the sort of the Finnish national epic. Um, it's kind of medieval in its the source, although it was kind of compiled synthetically later on in the 19th century. Um, then also, you know, things like Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Um, I mean, my uh, my academic training, you know, I have a, a master's in Germanic philology, which is basically the study of of medieval languages and the texts that uh, uh, which were used to, you know, uh, in which those languages appear. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot of the let's say the early appendix and really comes from that. To that, I would add the great epics of antiquity, specifically the Aeneid. Um, I think has been really foundational for forming my imagination. But there's also uh, a lot of like the uh, the red and blue and yellow fairy books from Andrew Lang, and uh, the um, uh, the writing of Alfred Lord Dunsany, mm -hmm. uh, who was somebody who had a, a, a really in, a remarkable influence on a lot of early fantasy writers uh, who would come after him. People like Clark Ashton Smith and H.P. Lovecraft and so on. Um, uh, William Morris, uh, especially the world, well at the world's end. Was a really um, that was a really important encounter, and uh, to all of this, I would actually add things like um, um, things like uh, Gene Wolfe's Solar Cycle, which didn't uh, because I only recently started reading it. It didn't have any influence on the world under Starlight, but it's definitely got some, you know, uh, some really similar vibes in certain ways. Uh, especially, I think some of the things that Wolf was trying to say about like time. And space and personhood and, and all these different things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's kind of I mean that's a, a broad and I have got a, a a longer list actually. Uh, uh, the you know the, there's a list in the book. One of the things that I would sort of include in my appendix N would be something like the Benedictine monastic diurnal, mm -hmm. um, because one of the interesting things about the Middle Ages is the way in which the the there was a you know like a life of prayer. That that was cyclic, right? A way of like marking time, but also like a way of of bringing significance and meaning into time. Uh, uh, to use the Greek terminology, like turning Kronos into Kairos, mm -hmm. uh, turning space into place, right? And so, uh, so that's also had a huge influence on things. So, I mean, one of the things that I think makes the setting really unique is that it does have its own a detailed sort of liturgical. Uh, uh, rubrics, right? Um, that there's actually, you know, uh, uh, it's, you know, one of the questions that, you know, the kinds of questions I like to answer are things like, well, how would actually, how would people pray in a fantasy world, right? If they believe the, the world was really this way and stuff like that, like, what if we did, what if instead of like just making a bad pastiche of like real world Christianity or paganism or something like that, what if we really thought about what are the implications of this world? What's the cosmology of this world? How would this affect? You know the ritual life of the just like the common people who live in who live there and who believe in this stuff, and so um, so I mean there so that's one of the things and this will be you know all of this will be in the in the books that are, that we have coming out. Um, there there are though in the role playing supplements themselves there will be like just enough of that kind of stuff for you to add flavor and texture to the world. But then if you want to go deeper um, or go deeper and kind of like mine it for material for your own adventures or just to read for fun if you're into this sort of thing. Um, the uh, there are actually a series of five books. The first two of which, at least, uh, you'll get in PDF form uh, uh, because they're a, a, as an add-on. Because um, it's one of the stretch goals that we unlocked, mm -hmm. um, but and possibly the other three, just depending on how the Kickstarter goes. So, uh, but those are like books of detailed. Uh, it's all the myths and legends, not just in like encyclopedia entries, how mm -hmm. people, what people believe to have happened, but also. 
let's say in a more participatory way like how would people actually participate in this myth like what's the ritual what how does it affect like you know what you eat that day and, and how you dress and where you go and what you do and how you greet each other and all that stuff mm-hmm. um, is going to be in those books so those are called the five books of oaths yeah. um, and that's yeah so that's that's like that the setting is kind of like of that character I guess you could say yeah, and taking that taking that into account, um, two th- two things on that. One, in a, a lot of games, when they when they really double down on a given setting, they will have certain sections written in of in universe style, as if you're reading somebody's journal or or notes or so, or something like that. Do you plan on doing something like that within parts of the book? Some parts of the book, uh, the core book probably won't have that so much. Although I, I mean, I do plan on like a, doing like a chapter header for uh, like that for each each of the chapters of the core book. Um, but then there's going to be a lot of a lot more of that kind of stuff in the campaign book. So the Kickstarter is for two books. We should just say uh, there's a core rule book, mm-hmm. um, and then there's a campaign book called Thunder in the North. And the campaign book is uh, it's really like a campaign toolbox. Um, this is actually the campaign that I've already run for my playgroup here uh, at home and um, basically I'm taking all of that material and putting it together into a book for a sort of a um, like a long form narrative campaign but also like with heavy sandbox elements uh, because what I really want to do is just give people tools to run the, the game that they want to run and also you know that kind of follows the their, their, their players are going to make different choices than my players so mm-hmm. um, but then the, but then like the books of the books of odes and all of the other uh, liter- literature, uh, some of which is being published through another publishing house called Darkly Bright Press, um, but all of the other literature for the world is written solely from the perspective of of somebody in the world. Um, this is this is actually something that Tolkien said that there's no tale without the teller. In other words, uh, whenever you're telling the story, you have to always keep in mind who is telling the story, because all re- narrators are to a certain extent unreliable um, and I really I really want to communicate that uh, for especially for the game masters who want to run this game because the the unreliability and sort of the gaps between different versions you know uh, for many myths there might be two or three different versions and one is accepted in one place and the other version is accepted somewhere else so then you know there's a discrepancy between those two two different versions and I almost never make it a, 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 a goal to try to solve those discrepancies, most often I just leave it there, and uh, that's a place where a lore master can kind of come in and say, uh, "I want to tell a story." Lore masters, what we call game masters in the in the system, mm-hmm. um, but I want to I want to try to tell a story that will actually fit into this gap between these two myths. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of like a weird goal because on the one hand, I want to I want to give people like. An immersive experience, so that they. I mean, this is not a one-size-fits-all RPG. I'm not trying to release like a universal system that you can apply to everything. Um, uh, eventually, we will be hopefully releasing a Clash SRD, so if people want to use the Clash rules for other systems. There'll be support for that. But really, what I'm looking to do is, is you know, on the one hand, give somebody a really immersive experience, but then on the other hand, uh, give them room and kind of the license that they need to tell their own stories. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking now, um, speaking of that, and this is something that I always ask whenever I get whenever a game is really doubling down on a specific um, region, it, whether it be region of the world or region in and yep. in, in inspired history. Um, with some, if if some of the names are a bit more esoteric, are you planning on having a bit of a pronunciation guide for some of yep, the names of the terms? Be- It'll be right at the beginning. Uh, pronunciation guides and translations for things. Kind kind of like how a lot of World of Darkness books had that lexicon section right at the start. Yep. Yep. We're gonna have that section right at the start. And it'll be like here's a bunch of common names. Uh, here's how to pronounce them, and here's what they mean. Um, and uh, actually, I mean, I'm a linguist, as I mentioned before, and so the the language work on, on the back end of the setting has been pretty extensive. Um, working not just on languages, but on really like language families, you could say, uh, the way that English and German are ultimately related, or something like that. Um, and so, uh, my hope is that, and, and it is fun to like see players already doing this in, in playtest, right? Is that people will like 
once they once they have two or three names translated, they start to notice like common elements of the names. They're like, wait, so does this word mean, da -da -da, you know? And uh, that's been pretty cool to see. So yeah, I'll we'll have a glossary for all the words, all the Emporian words that appear in the book and how to pronounce them, what they mean. And uh, hopefully that'll be uh, hopefully that'll be helpful. So in the same vein, I'm guessing in the character creation section, you're going to have a short list of example names to to kind of help people build off of? That's right. So in the character creation section, we'll have um, 100 Emborian names that people can choose for names for their characters. Um, and, then in, uh, and then additionally, for each culture, there will be 20 to 30. So there are, uh, so this game is really all about the Emborians, uh, about the Ambori, mm -hmm. uh, the Children of Water and Starlight. You can say more about them in a minute if you want. But they... Um, uh, but then they're divide they're further divided up into five subcultures, some of which are only a little different from each other, and some of which are like pretty radically different from each other. Um, and so uh, there are there are so there's a hundred names included, which are just general like everybody, any any and boring could have these names. But then there are like culturally or like regionally specific names. Um, the way that you know, especially not even so much nowadays. Because we're more homogenized in the U.S., but you know, even 50 or 60 years ago, somebody has a certain name, you'd be like, "Oh, your family must be Italian, right?" Uh, that kind of a thing. So, we'll, we'll so it'll be a, um, um, it'll be a, uh, like a little bit, bit of extra character, a little bit of extra flavor. So there will be some names that are really specific to cultures as well. Mm -hmm. Lots of names. Yeah. Now. Shifting into a bit of the mechanics, you are using, as I understand it, a modified version of the D100 sy system that was first published in Jackals, um, That's the right. Crash system. Um, That's what, right. Of all the of all these setups, when it comes to your core mechanics, what made you go with that one, and what made you go with um, a D100 system in general? Yeah. So it's a couple of things. Uh, one is that I was one of the original playtesters for Jackals. Um, and when I was actually playing it and running it, I had already been running uh, Emboria for some friends with a hack of another system, uh, which was a lot of fun in certain respects, but also I, I felt like the combat specifically was really lacking. Um, and I wanted it to be more dramatic and more fun and also like a little crunchier. Um, and so uh, Jackals is a beautifully designed game because it's there's a certain amount of crunch there. Um, I, maybe I define crunch a little different from uh, some people, but for me, crunch is about like fiddliness. How many options do you have? So there's a little bit of crunch there, but combat is also like really fast in Clash, mm -hmm. um, and it's always it's reactive. There's no sitting around waiting for your turn to happen. There's no sitting passively when somebody attacks you. You know you have options, um, and the, because you always have options. Um, as a player, you always feel like you have agency in a fight, but also the fights tend to go pretty quickly. Yeah. And uh, so I really fell in love with the combat system specifically. And there were a lot of other things that I liked. Um, I liked the way that the approach to magic as being part of like a ritual system as opposed to just like arbitrarily, here's this list of spells, right? And uh, you can cast Fireball and I can cast Fireball, even though we're like, I'm a cleric and you're a wizard or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I like I, I really really liked that approach and you know uh, I'm sure Jam would not mind me saying I influenced that approach because these are long long talks we had about you know for years before he made Jackals about you know what uh, you know what would a magic system really look like if we wanted it to like um, because I I mean I think one of the things that's lacking especially in D20 games and I'm not hating on 5e or D and D or anything like that. Um, I love D and D. Don't I worry. Don't don't worry. Everybody yeah. gets the roast here. Yes. Yes. I. I. Yeah. But uh, what I will say, one thing is really lacking, especially for modern D twenty games, fifth edition, Pathfinder, so on, is a sense of wonder uh, associated with the magic. The magic is just kind of there, and it's it's expected, and like you sort of like uh, as a player, you expect, you know, like yeah, it's just like it's expected that the game runs on magic, basically. Um, and what I really want is like that sense of like wonder and strangeness and maybe even a little bit of danger uh, with associated with it. So anyway, jackals. Uh, so this is these are all things that we talked about 
as Jam was working on Jackals, and I and when I played through it, I was like, you know what? With just a few changes, I think this would be a wonderful uh, vehicle for Emboria. And so then I just started kind of rewriting Emboria, or re rather rewriting Jackals to kind of fit Emboria, coming up with, you know, what would the ritual traditions be in a world under Starlight and things like that. And so obviously there are going to be a lot of commonalities. Um, you know, uh, the the core mechanics of the game are the same. It's a D100 skill-based roll-under system. Mm -hmm. As for why a D100 system, uh, I really like the flat, let's say the flat progression of D100 games, right? Where you kind of choose your own path and you choose how your character is going to progress. You're not locked in to a single class, but then also your character, as your character progresses, and it's not like, you know, there's a there's a weird let's say, like, progression in 5th um, uh, edition D&D, for instance, where you go from being, like, a pretty competent hero at level, you know, 3, let's say, to being basically a god at level 20, right? You know, and so uh, that that's, like, a really... It's a really steep power increase, right? It's a really steep power increase. And actually, if you look at the D&D 5th &D edition uh, DMG, and you kind of do the math on how many encounters you're expected to have per day and how much XP you're supposed to get from those encounters and so on, what you'll see is that the, the rules basically implicitly expect that you are going to progress from uh, level uh, from level 1 to level 20 in about, I think I did the math, it's like 31 or 32 days of in-game time. Um, and that's just not the kind of story that I want to tell in the world under Starlight. Um, and so the the the, the stories in the world under Starlight are, are focused on like long term, so you could say like community based stories. And so, um, my expectation if you play in my campaign is that you'll be playing a different character by the end of it. Maybe your character will have died, but most likely they'll just have gotten old or too scarred, or whatever, and they'll or, or they'll have gotten you know married or committed in some other sort of ways. generational play. Right, right, and so so like generational play for Emporia is the is the baseline assumption. Um, you Obviously, you can play one shot, and it's fun, but the basic assumption of the game and the rules, and especially with the seasonal undertakings, so this idea that you adventure, you might go on two or three adventures in a year. Well, what's your character doing the rest of the time? Well, what they're doing the rest of the time is trying to increase their, uh, increase their influence, trying to build up the communities that they're a part of, uh, trying to investigate, search for answers, find lore, uh, but also maybe they want to write a, a, a play and start a theater house and maybe they want to found a military order and maybe they just want to uh, build a fleet of merchant ships and accrue some wealth that the party can use later all of these things are things you can do in Emporia mm -hmm. um, uh, as part of your seasonal undertakings and so those, like the idea is that between each adventure almost like, there's almost like a little mini game that could be as, as simple as you know, I just message you and say, hey, what's your seasonal undertaking before our next session? Or it might be uh, we set up like a little 30-minute mini session and roll some things out, roll play some things out. So there's a, there's some leeway there. But uh, but this, to me, like this this kind of generational play, which I which we did in my Supers game. Again, you know, the Supers game went 16 years um, and people were playing second, third, fourth generation characters by the end. Uh, uh, but I also ran a another game that was really influential for me, which should definitely be in my appendix and at least when it comes to game design, is uh, the first edition of the One Ring RPG, uh, which I which is a game I really love. Um, but they, there's a there's a campaign that comes with that uh, called The Darkening of Mirkwood, and The Darkening of Mirkwood takes place over the course of 30 in-game years, um, and we played through it. I played through it with a group. Uh, we played for seven and a half years in real time uh, to get through that 30-year 30, 30 game period. And people were, again, they were playing like the grandchildren of the original characters by the end. Yeah. Um, and it was really awesome, really, really satisfying, and also like affected all of us in a, re in a deep way that, you know, where it wasn't just I care about my character, right? There are lots of good games for that. But it was like, I care about this community that so many people that I love, like so many characters that I love, have fought and died to build up and protect. And now it's being threatened. And now that feels really personal, you know? Um, so that's the kind of game that I want to run. And it's the kind of game I want to play in. So Thunder in the North is going to be a, um, it's going to be a, 
Uh, it's going to be a 10-year campaign, a uh, 10, 10 in-game year campaign, uh, with an average of about two adventures per year, um, although in the final years, those are mostly just outlines because you know, the last two or three years, there's almost there's no telling where your campaign will be. But um, but basically, it's all the tools you need to run like a ten or more in-game year, long-form, multi-generational campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, which again, for me, that's that's the juice, man. Yeah. Um, when you meant when you mentioned the idea of a campaign taking place over several years, um, and multiple characters being used, there were two games that. Came, that instantly came to mind, and I'm curious if these games have been brought up to you while develop while developing Amboria or in, or during this Kickstarter. Um, one of them is the passion play kind of design in Ars Magica, where okay. you're you're somewhat ex- it's somewhat expected that because of that design you're going to be playing uh, multiple characters as a player. Oh, okay. The other, and this is this is the bigger one. Um, especially given the whole year over year thing, is Pendragon. Oh yeah, Pendragon. Uh, so I've never played Earth Magic. I'm I'm only like a little familiar with it. But Pendragon is that's the granddaddy of the style of play. Like um, Darkening of Mirkwood, which I mentioned a moment ago, was directly influenced by the Great Pendragon campaign. And um, I have. Alas, I have never gotten to play the Great Pendragon campaign. I have read through it multiple times, fantasized about running it. I even have a giant notebook that uh, every few years I just go back and I read all the medieval Arthurian stuff, and I just fill notebooks with ideas for when I run that campaign one day. And I would say, you know, again, talking about Appendix N, man, the Arthurian stuff has influenced the world under Starlight in more ways than I can probably even put a finger on. Um, love those stories. There's something really just like deeply strange and weird and mysterious about all the stories that sort of collect around the person of Arthur. And uh, the definitely like the magic, um, the magic in there is just really weird, really really weird. Uh, so much like this is, I don't know. I just it's to me so much more compelling than a lot of modern fantasy. But anyway, yeah, uh, great Pendragon campaign. That's the granddaddy of this this play style. And uh, someday, someday. Um, I'm gonna run it. Yeah. Um, is that is that like how s- someday we'll be able to walk into the 1997 procrastinators convention? Yes, someday. Well, I mean, the thing with running a big Arthurian campaign is you have to find some people who are like really into that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's it's such a specific kind of a thing, and you have to get people who are like, you know what, I really like Mallory. Let's do that for the next ten years of our life. Um, and I do have one or two people who are interested, but uh, just the right group hasn't come together yet. Um, I hope that it does, though. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of speaking of that, uh, when it comes to when it comes to utilizing, you talked about one about wanting to add in a degree of, a degree of wonder, which. Yeah. For, ma- for magic, it's very it's very easy to do that just from a narrative perspective. Yeah, if you're a good if you're a good GM, you can cover almost anything. But the real interesting part of that is how is how to express that in mechanics, especially if somebody is I'm not going to say a spellcaster, but somebody who is magic adjacent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of this does come down to narrative, and I'm trying to pr- provide as many good. Uh, resources as possible for game masters for lore masters to uh, do this but I mean like so for instance um, the the main you could say almost like the most common sort of quote unquote spellcaster class right are the priestesses of the sacred well so the sacred well is the primary order uh, the primary uh, religious order or the primary religious like uh, uh you know, basically the official Emborian religion, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it has a, a female only priesthood. Uh, so the queen is the high priest, uh, high priestess, and then and then you know, kind of descending down from her. And um, it are there there are these women who tend these sacred wells. Some of them are like large shrines and monasteries in major cities. Others are just like tiny forgotten, sp- you know, natural springs on an island in the middle of the sea that nobody's been to for a hundred years. Um, 
but there is the women who tend these um, these naturally occurring springs which feed into the sea um, so the campaign happens in the lands around the sea um, basically uh, the, the the main campaign is set in an area a little bit larger than you could say like the Aegean Sea um, uh, which if you think about it you know according uh, history indicates that is quite enough area for many generations of interesting and terrible terrible things to happen but um and uh but it's uh you know but but the water and the relationship of water and starlight and all that stuff for the emborians is very deeply mystical and also you could say ontological it affects their very being and who they are and how they conceive of themselves and so it's the job of the priestesses of the sacred wells to tend these wells and cleanse them preserve them protect them um and there are also the certain uh, uh, the ancient oaths of earth and heaven that they have to bear witness to and kind of renew on a daily basis. Anyway, uh, so this is one of the ritual, uh, one of the more common, let's say, ritual uh, traditions, ritual paths that a player character could choose. Um, and uh, these, um, uh, and if you do this, then you, you'll get like some general rights that any well priestess knows. And then also some that are really specific to where you're from. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, because their religion might be a little bit different in different parts of, of the world. But uh, but the rites themselves are hymns. And uh, the book provides descriptions for the hymns. Um, but then also, like, we'll, in an appendix, we're going to provide just the actual text of the hymns, mm -hmm. which is already written. I mean, that stuff pre-existed the game by, dec you know, a decade. So we're going to provide the actual text of the hymns. So the way this plays out at my table, and, and this is really just my players because they're into it, this is how they want to play. The way this plays out at my table is that the players uh, will very often read the hymn or read an excerpt from it as they're casting the right. Um, so they're casting the right, they'll read the hymn, and the, some of the hymns actually have a call and response. Uh, they have a call and response feature to them where they actually become augmented or become more powerful or more useful if other players also join in the ritual. Um, and so a good example of this is the Litany of Banishment, mm -hmm. which is a real good thing for getting evil things away from you fast, let's say. So the priestess can start chanting the Litany of Banishment, uh, but then the other players, and you can do this in the middle of combat, the other players have the option if they want to, to contribute some of their clash points. So clash points are basically the, the basis of the action economy in the clash system which is used by jackals and now by emporia um, they basically they let you react to things take extra actions add damage all kinds of stuff uh, you get a certain number every round so if players want to they can contribute some of their clash points to the priestess's ritual it doesn't take away their turn or anything like that but it basically represents them you know engaging in the sort of the call and response right um so she's saying the she's she's chanting litany and they're saying the responses um and uh my players will actually do this you know around the table and it's chilling in a good way like it's 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 just this really really compelling moment um and it's really immersive for everybody the same thing with like the funeral rites and things like that all of this stuff exists and um it's not to say every player is going to want to do this or will be comfortable to do this but like basically my my pledge as a designer is as far as you want to go down the rabbit hole i will be there with you Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so that's just like one way that that I think it really helps with the sense of wonder, but also just like the magic itself is is much more. It's it's fairly subtle. You're you're never going to see somebody like casting a, a lightning bolt or something like that, right? The way that the magic works is is kind of fairly subtle, and it affects things in, uh, you could say, indirect ways. Um, and then there's also just a lot of stuff in the world that is, especially in certain locations, it's like so the world. It's not a high it's not a high magic setting mm -hmm. in the sense that you're going to be walking down the street and see like, like a magic powered, you know, gondola sailing overhead or something like that. It's very much kind of a late antiquity, dark ages feel in that sense. But there are places that are more magical than others. And when you go to these places, there are just very strange things that can happen to you. Um, uh, uh, many of them have to do with just sort of like the eddies that, uh, uh, let's say, the river of time gets caught in. And uh, so you'll you'll have these opportunities during the campaign to actually go back into the past. Um, uh, we had some players who like created a whole like grandfather paradox for themselves. 
Um, and um, yeah, just it, it, so it's it's like it's like mysterious, uh, wondrous, and I think that, but I think that wonder comes from a combination. You know, when we, we when we feel wonder about things, it's not just surprise because then we wouldn't feel wonder on our second visit to the Grand Canyon, right? So when we feel wonder about something, we feel wonder because we've encountered something that is is large, uh, larger than ourselves, right? And then uh, you know maybe older than ourselves or something, but also usually it's because of something of great beauty. Yeah. And uh, it's very very important to make this game and this world be above all else beautiful. And that is not to say it's perfect or everything is black and white or or whatever like. Even the official adventures that are, that will be coming out in the core book are very, let's say, very complex, very ambiguous, lots of political intrigue and that sort of a thing. But there's a sort of like uh, beneath all the grime and all the the corruption that's currently uh, affecting the the nation and the setting right now. Um, beneath all of that stuff, there is also uh, there are things you say moments of great beauty that kind of like. Um, that that shine out at these odd moments in the story, and um, and uh, you know, I think that hopefully that's going to also be where the wonder comes from. Mm -hmm. And it, it's good that you mentioned that because I've I have seen many people talk talk up a storm about how we need to bring back that sense of wonder in yeah. um, fa in fantasy gaming. But whenever I hear th whenever I hear the talk about it, I ended up t I end up tuning out. And sure, yeah. the big. A big reason for that is two is twofold. One is, um, it's very one is it being very clear that they're that they're talking they're the way that they talk is is if they're the ones being the GM, which in a lot of these situations they're not because they're not at my yep. table. Yeah. There's also the fact that a lot or there's a lot of emphasis on emotive, almost pur purple prosy language instead of okay getting down to brass tacks, how do we put that in both the mechanics and the narrative? Because putting it in the narrative, anybody can do that. You just have to yep. have you just have to have a good sense of description as a GM. Like yep. but narrative is only one is only one half of the matter. My mentor used to say, um, a novelist is shorthand for a bad DM. Nice. Which a bit extreme, yeah, but be but um that was that was kind of his thing for one and two, in a roundabout way he's right. <laughs> like yeah if you if you're if you have a specific story that you want to tell and only that story and not deviate go write a novel all. go write a damn novel go write a damn screenplay agree. and le and leave the and leave the actual role playing to the people who want to role play who want to role play at the table oh um, and that's yeah i could not agree more and that's the reason why th why this whole thing of we need we need to bring this wonder or weirdness or what have you into fa into fantasy ga into fantasy games is so frustrating because everybody is only tackling half of the problem. Like you can you can write a you... what good is a is a lengthy elaborate description going to be if at the end of the day I'm still ro I'm still rolling the at the end of the day I'm still rolling to cast magic missile. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. This is this is really important because I think it's a mistaking of what of what uh, wonder really is. Like uh, again, it's like it's it's it confuses it with novelty. Like if that's somebody's idea of wonder, it'll only work the first time, and then the next six castings of magic missile. When you hear my amazing description of what it looks like again, you're going to be like, uh, right? I know the thing with the Right? Can I just can I just roll damage? You know. Um, so for me, wonder it's not about novelty, um, but also I think it's it, it is something that's emergent and it takes a while to play out. I I would not expect I would never try to pitch somebody uh, and say say to them you're going to experience deep wonder in our very first session. Like a I'm not like I can't promise that. But B, like for me, the the like I said before, like the the real juice, like what really makes a campaign a great campaign, is a sort of lo a sustained long term commitment. Um, and so, I you could say it's for me, it's more about trying to create a, a system and setting in which I find wonder, and which you know my players have found it, and um, 
and then handing that off and you know sort of saying all right guys i gave it my best go but now it's going to be up to you to tell your stories um and uh and also like for your players to make decisions that are, that are gonna you know that'll screw everything up just like my players did and uh and we were all the better for it and i'm i'm guessing a lot of the a lot of this um establishing wonder is going to be in a in its own G, in its own gm section because oh it's i think it's i think it's very important to establish that to the players so that they're not so that they're doing it in their way not not to the players yeah. to the gm so that it's so that it's so that the GM is able to carry that sense of wonder without it feeling like a um, carbon copy of what you would have done as a GM. And and uh, my basically the way that I'm approaching this, especially with the campaign book, is just to uh, we'll have all the normal materials in there, you know, hex maps and timelines and some pre-written adventures and NPCs and world tables and all that stuff. But I'm also just filling it up with here's me just writing to you, GM to GM. Mm -hmm. Here's here's what here's what I did. Here's what here's what I had planned, and here's how my players went in a different direction with it. And just like because what I want to give you, what I want to really give people is a toolkit for their own campaign. Um, I have never ever ever just picked a campaign uh, book up off the shelf and r ran it, you know front to back exactly like the guy who wrote it or the gal who wrote it intended because that's just not how things work it's just not how it goes right there's something that, of myself that goes into that there's my players who are the you know like the big you know you you all, you make all the most powerful and interesting people in your world right people that you have no control over and then you know you're not you're never going to stick to a story unless you're a uh, you know again unless you're, you're kind of the worst kind of gm so um yeah my 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 approach to this, yeah, there's going to be a lot of GM advice, but it won't really be advice. It'll just be me talking to you, game master to game master. Um, this is this is how I use this. This is where I got this from. Here's what here's how I read it when it happened. Things like that, and just try to basically, um, I I hope more than anything else, just to kind of like give people the inspiration they need to to run their own game. Mm -hmm. Now. You admit, you admit, you had, you had mentioned classes early, early on, which is a bit amusing to me because, as I recall, Jackals is not a is not a class based system. The closest to that is, yeah. are you a ritualist or are you not? Yeah, and it's the same thing. This is not a class based game. Hmm. I don't. Maybe I misspoke or something. I'm not sure. It's probably it's, a case of old habits, like asking asking a lefty to catch a ball with their right hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably, but no, it's not a class based game. Um, uh, that's actually the whole the whole reason that I you know one of the main reasons I went with the D100 is because for for long term games and again I do enjoy D and D and things like that but for a really long term game what I found is that the the classless flat progression that a D100 gives you where you can just kind of build your character out over time this is what I said earlier that so you're not just like locked into the progression that your class has and that's all you have um, I think that that makes for a better game. If you're playing for several years, yeah. Now, yeah. one of the big one of the big things that is a is a key part of character creation within um, Jackals is your choice of culture, and since and um that certainly makes sense for Jackals because it's meant to be just it's meant to be Bronze Age fantasy, not a spe not a yeah. specific region. Since the idea of the of the Bronze Age Empire is that it. That encompasses multiple multiple nations and nation states of that of that yeah. time. More nation states than full on nations. But with Amboria, because it's taking place in a specific re in a specific region and a specific people, are you still are you still going to have that cho that choice of co that choice of culture within character yes. creation? Yes, there there are five cultures you can choose from to start with, and there will be more later. Um, and actually, whole different races later on you know, that I have planned for future books. Mm -hmm. But the beginning game is just focused on you know basically choosing to go deep rather than wide. Even with something like the Bronze Age, right? It's only from the remove of many centuries that we could look at something like and 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 say with air quotes, there's something there's su there's such a thing as Greek culture, right? Well, we're, what we're actually doing when we say that is making a whole series of generalizations 
about actually dozens and dozens of kingdoms and city states which had their own different you know pottery styles and art and different beliefs about the gods and their own local you know you know what i'm saying like like athens and sparta right are the ones that everybody knows but they have two radically different cultures but also they're both greek right um and so it's the same kind of a thing here um, everybody is, uh, all play, player characters, at least at the, the beginning, are Amborians. They're all Ambori, the children of water and starlight. Ambori are, um, they're the, 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 the culture about whom I've been writing all these stories over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, um, they're, uh, human-like. Um, they have, uh, uh, longer lifespans by a couple of decades than, uh, on average than humans do. Um, they have ever so slightly bluish skin and um, some of them can breathe underwater and uh, although not all of them and for those who do there are sometimes consequences but anyway um, so that's the main culture and uh, but then within that culture there are five subcultures which are basically regional and some of them have a totally different religion others have just a very different approach to the same religion. Uh, not to not to mention, you know, there are varying different degrees of relationship to uh, to the monarchy, which has fallen into corruption. To um, you know, their outlook on life, the history that they've been through. Who, you know, each culture kind of has you know their own sort of ancient ancestral enemies over and against. You know, somebody who somebody who uh, is from the northern district has really probably never had to worry about the threat of the Kodihan, who are like these deeply beautiful shape-shifting giants um, that the Sopori in the West are, have been fighting perpetually for centuries. So so all of that has shaped even things like architecture and sensibilities and um, uh, social mores and things like that. So uh, it's all one nation, or you could say one nation or like one people group, but they are um, but they are uh, uh, distinct enough that they're different cultures, and they the cultures have different ver- uh, cultural virtues and focuses, and um, they definitely play differently. Mm-hmm. And with that in mind, what do you shoot for both of the books? What are you shooting for as far as the page count goes? Yeah, so I'm not good at estimating page count uh, to publication. Um, I can tell you that the rough word count for both books is going to be about 100 to 120,000 words, which as these things go is not very long. Um, so the core book should be about the same size as the Jackal's core book. Um, and the campaign book will be probably just a little bit smaller. Um, so whatever whatever page count that, that turns out to be. Um, we're talking about, we've talked about some different print formats. I think we're going to go with the sort of like the, the standard larger core RPG book. I actually really like the form factor of the Jackal's book. But the publishers made the decision to go with a slightly larger form factor, among other things, because it will give us more options with cover art. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that will go out to. Probably around 200 pages for the core book. So it's not it's not going to be a brick. Um, uh, I'm trying to keep it down to just like the stuff that the stuff that you really need, the stuff that's really useful, or the stuff I feel like is just like really cool. And um, you know, and then the, the core book will have uh, between one and three uh, pre-written adventures in it, mm-hmm. and then there will be twenty more adventures in the campaign book. Plenty, plenty to keep you busy. Right, and I will certainly be looking forward to it. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness. Well, thank you very much. Um, it is uh, I'm I'm always down to uh, step in and and uh, uh, have a couple of drinks with some monks. And thanks for all the. I mean, this is really a great interview. I've done a lot of interviews, and uh, sometimes people don't always know how to ask good questions. And and uh, these were great questions. And uh, I hope everybody enjoys this. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've got a link or something to the Kickstarter you can share. But if not, I'll I'll get that for you. Yeah, I got that. I got that taken care of. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, <clears throat> the door is always open. As Fantastic. I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. Thanks very much. Mm-hmm.
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!